Hey everyone and welcome back to a new video. So there we have it. We knew this was going to be a pretty big Adepticon all things considered but looking back it's kind of hard to overstate just how incredible those announcements and reveals were and that includes all of the Warhammer games. Looking just to 40k though this was nothing short of a seismic event. We got the reveal of Lionel Johnson, only the second loyalist Primarch to come to 40k and he wasn't even the main event. We also got the reveal of 10th edition including a breakdown of how it's different from 9th and a quick look at some of the new units including the upgrade Terminators and Tyranid Termagants. So in this video I wanted to share my thoughts on what we saw for Warhammer 40k. There's certainly a lot to talk about so let's jump right in. And let's start with the 10th edition announcement. We all but knew it was coming for a number of reasons. Firstly, it was reaching the usual three year window where Games Workshop normally likes to update its games. Secondly, we've just had our end of edition campaign with the Arcs of Omen. And thirdly, and this is where we start talking about 10th ed, 9th edition was really in need of change. What we heard in the first instance was a massive shift in how the game is going to be supported and managed. All of the stratagem bloat we saw across the codexes is going out the window and instead all of the faction and army specific rules will be able to fit onto two pages. That in and of itself is massively exciting. The codexes of 9th edition were some of the best in terms of production quality but they were near undecipherable at times if you were new to the faction or wanted to check a rule quickly. I've got almost all of the 9th edition codexes and when casually going through their rules and trying to understand how the armies work you kind of forget that this is meant to be a fast paced tabletop game instead of exam prep. To be fair, Games Workshop were also feeling that bloat. The recent meta update showed how volatile changes could be and as we saw with the leagues of OTAN, when they needed to change something in a codex, the FAQ system was rather clunky and flew in the face of all the hard work that went into the codexes in the first place. So with all that said, the fact we're streamlining those rules is a fantastic thing to hear. In addition to the army and faction rules fitting onto two pages, there will only be a handful of army specific stratagems, around six per army, which will complement a similar handful of universal ones. That doesn't just help the flow of the game, avoiding the constant flicking back and forth through codexes looking for the right stratagem, but it also makes it easier to anticipate what your opponent might try next. Previously, a player might have 20 stratagems to pull out at any moment, most of which you know nothing about. Now there's a little more common ground and that makes the game far more interesting in my view because stratagems aren't this all-consuming part of the game anymore, they simply add a new dynamic. But it's not just stratagems that are getting leaner, we've also seen the new design for the data sheets, which somewhat mirror the war scrolls we've already seen in Age of Sigma and their quick reference cards. As before, a big focus is to get all the rules for that unit onto their data sheet, so you're spending more time rolling dice instead of leafing through books. However, there's some more substantial changes. For example, some of the stats that used to be attached to a model have now shifted to their weapons. As we heard in the reveal, this means the designers can be a bit more flexible when it comes to tuning specific weapons. A power fist for a captain, for example, may act slightly differently to say a lieutenant's. We'll have to see more to really understand it but anything that helps bring more flexibility to the rule set is a good thing in my mind. One of the biggest changes though comes with the new OC stat. This stands for objective control and effectively decides how effective a model or unit is at holding an objective. Using the example we saw, each termagant has an OC value of 2, so a unit of 20 will have a total score of 40. That might be great against small units who have a lower total score, but a knight might have a value of perhaps 50 and that would allow the knight to deny the objective. You can already see how that fixes some of the issues that surrounded objectives secured in 9th edition and it kind of feels a lot more intuitive in so much that numbers are king in most circumstances but certain heavier units or elites might be able to deny them in the right circumstances. Moving on from that, the morale phase is moving into the command phase and the psychic phase is being scrapped altogether and instead those abilities are being weaved into the data sheets themselves. So for example a space marine librarian will be able to use smite as a shooting attack but with caveats to show the risk in using those abilities. To be honest there's so much to talk about when it comes to how 10th edition is going to be different from 9th and all of it sounds great. But almost above anything else, I think Games Workshop showed that they're listening. We're getting simplified rules and codexes, there's a new simple army structure, the rules are all going to be free at launch which is an incredibly good gesture and they've positioned Combat Patrol as its own way of getting into and playing 40k without having to take on the deeper rules behind it. It feels like 40k at its most accessible and understandable and while we've still got plenty to see before we get a real sense of how the game plays, I think the Adepticon announcements really allayed our fears about what was really holding 9th edition back and whether that was going to do the same with 10th edition. Far from it, 10th ed looks like the best refresh to 40k in decades and that's a pretty promising start. 
Turning to some of the model reveals, let's start with the Terminators. It was rumoured for some time that new Terminators were coming and I'll be honest, even I was starting to think that they would primaricise them at some point. Well, thankfully I was wrong. What we got instead was truer scale Terminators in the classic design that we all know and love and even better, they're going to sit front and centre in the new launch set when it arrives this summer. Depending on how long you've been in the hobby, you may recall when the current Terminator models were released during 4th edition and yet yeah, they've done quite a service. But back then it was so exciting to see how cool the new models looked on the tabletop and players like me were rushing to buy them up and build cool new armies with them. I feel the same here and it goes to show that Games Workshop doesn't have to massively redesign a model to make it exciting or to grab our attention. Sometimes it's just about putting a new polish on a classic design and these Terminators are about as classic as it gets. I guess the question on a lot of people's minds though is will we see a new Deathwing variant coming out soon given all the Dark Angels releases as of late? Certainly one to watch. But switching to the Tyranids, we did see the new Termagant model, which I presume will also be the basis for the new Hormagon models, but that's not been confirmed. Again, it's a polished version of a classic, and I'm glad that Games Workshop didn't feel the need to replace the Termagants altogether. As they spoke about at Adepticon, the Tyranids are evolving, and that could have been used to excuse an entire new range of models. But thankfully, they've kept things consistent with the core look of the Battle Line Tyranids, and in a really impressive way. The new sculpting and mould techniques that GW has developed really allow for so much more detail and you can see that so clearly with these models. The Termagant has muscle sinews the previous version didn't and its textured armour just gives it a much more predatory vibe. Switching to the trailer briefly, I know there's a lot in there that's new and while I would love to share my thoughts on all of those, I'll probably save that for another video. However, it's clear that it's going to be an exciting launch box if that trailer is anything to go by. But overall, and while it might feel a bit conceited, Games Workshop are right to call these reveals mind-blowing because they show how, much like the Tyranids, this game is evolving to meet a new audience but is also staying consciously true to the core elements that make this game so nostalgic for many of us and that's a really cool and exciting place to be right now. But let's turn to the main model reveal of the day, Lionel Johnson. You may have caught Valrak's reaction to it and kudos to him and Major Kill for predicting this far in advance, but like him we were all speechless despite the fact we kind of suspected it was coming. You may be surprised to know but it was almost 6 years to the day that Rebute Gilliman was released and whether it's a coincidence or planning, the timing of this new Primarch's arrival could not have been better. The Arcs of Omen campaign has made the galaxy of the 41st millennium more perilous than ever and Gilliman, if the trailer is to offer any insight, is probably getting a bit overwhelmed by the scale of the conflicts happening around him. To that end, the Lion seems to be picking up the reins in Imperium Nihilus to deal with the Chaos threat, while Gilliman likely deals with the hordes of Tyranids knocking on the door of the Galactic West. We'll find out more in his Arcs of Omen book which I suspect will go out for pre-order in about 3-4 to four weeks once Farsight is safely out the way but not too close to the release of 10th edition in the summer. But let's talk about the model itself. I do want to do a separate video diving deeper into the symbolism of the line but there are three things about this model that really impress me. First is the pose. It's passive and quietly menacing which suits the line exceedingly well. He was famous or perhaps I should say infamous for his overly secret and taciturn nature but we see an inner tension forming when we look at his face. The body is relaxed but fury burns in his eyes which are focused solely on the enemy he seeks to vanquish. It's subtle but it conveys so much about the character and the inner struggles he's facing. It's also quite a departure from the line model we got for the Horus Heresy which was much more energised as you might expect given the threats he was facing at the time. But if anything, I think the contrast shows that the line of the 41st millennium is a very different person to the line of the Horus Heresy and the reasons for that difference are going to come to the forefront as he tackles the threats of chaos while working as best he can with Gilliman. The second standout feature are his weapons. Surprisingly, he has a brand new sword called Fealty. I personally thought he would have been reunited with the Lion Sword but given the history Gilliman and Johnson have with that weapon, maybe the latter left it with Cypher. Either way, the fact Cypher still has it is something that I think will have to be addressed soon since it's kind of a big mystery behind both characters. In any case, his shield is the Emperor's own shield, creating a nice symmetry between the Lion and Gilliman who wields the Emperor's sword. Together, Fealty and the Emperor's shield embody the two values that Johnson cares for most, sworn loyalty and his role as the Imperium's defender. Over the course of 10th edition, I think we'll see both of those values tested to the full. We know he duels Angron in his upcoming Arcs of Omen book and the Lion's return raises questions about Luther and his apparent goal to reunite the Fallen into a Legion scale force once again. There's certainly no time for a welcome back party. 
And lastly, I think the variety of head options for the Lions model are superb, and they do something we're seeing more and more of across Warhammer models. Like Abaddon's three head options, these four varieties each infuse the model with a slightly different tone. The helmed options strengthen the aesthetic of the Noble Knight, while the unhelmed ones bring that otherwise absent fury and scorn to the forefront. Similarly, the cow, a signature piece for the Dark Angels, nods towards that sense of shame that many Dark Angels feel for the events on Caliban during the Heresy, while the uncowed options cast aside that shame in an act of seemingly self-repentance on the battlefield. Admittedly, it's my personal reading, but it's something I really love about Warhammer as a whole, the way the models toy with the imagination and just bring out a new creativity in us all. So that's a very brief and headline view of what we saw from Warhammer 40k at Adepticon. Again, it's hard to overstate how monumental these reveals were and felt, and it's incredible that in a few short months, we'll have a new Primarch, a new edition of 40k, and a host of new Space Marines and Tyranids. I know we've all said it before, but it feels more real than ever when I say this is a fantastic time to be into Warhammer. But what did you make of the reveals, and what are your expectations for the months and perhaps even years ahead? Let me know in the comments section. And as always, a massive thank you for joining me today. If you enjoyed the video, please do click the like button and subscribe to the channel if you want to join me for more Warhammer content. And I hope you'll join me for my next video. Until then, however, take care.